بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين بار الخلاق أجمعين سيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا مولانا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وللبيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين الذين اصطفاهم الله اجمعين اما بعد فقال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق وهو اصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وانك لعلى خلق عظيم صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات على محمد وال محمد اللهم صل على محمد my respected elders my respected brothers and sisters i bid you all assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I start in the name of Allah, the omniscient, the omnipotent, all praise is due to Allah for giving us the ability to exist and to interact with this, this existence. Because the very aspect and the fact that we are able to interact with the existence that we have is the blessing within itself. In order for us to acknowledge and understand that there's a potential for us to reach. And it's interesting to note that upon our existence, Allah never immediately takes us and puts us straight to heaven and tells us to live and to enjoy and to get from the blessings that He has given us. But Allah leaves it up to us to go through a process of harm and evil and through a process of education and self-understanding within this world in order for us to be able to deserve that world hereafter. And the very irony of life, and we ask about this all the time, is that, Oh Allah, if you have so much care for me and so much well-being, and love in your heart for me, then why create me? Have the ability to send me to a place where you can immediately remove any sorts of evil, but take me out of that place and put me in a land or in an area where there's so much evil and killing that happens, and then you are to take me once again after I finish from this land and put me in the place which you had originally created me for. Because to some people it doesn't make sense that Allah has the ability to take us and to put us in the best of places but immediately does not do so and puts us on earth in order for you and I to go through some sort of trial and tribulation. And that's the very paradox of life. Because interestingly, the way that human beings work is that you and I work through suffering and pain. That when you and I achieve something on earth and when you and I strive and struggle for something, there is immediate value in that thing which we struggle for. And Allah understood that if I take human beings and I put them immediately in Jannah and they stay there for eternity and forever, then the whole trial process of their lives where they grow and their potential is increased is immediately removed. Yesterday, we touched on the topic of haram and halal specifically and the idea that when human beings do something good, they either receive a, a positive note or when they do something bad, they receive a negative note. And we said that the world of God and the world that we live in is not as petty and is not the way that we think it is. Many people when they view God's system, they view God's system in a very positive and negative note. If I have 10 good deeds and I negative and subtract one bad deed, that means I'm left with nine good deeds and Allah on the day of judgment will forgive me or will love me or will put me in heaven. And it's interesting to know that the way the system of Allah works is not through meters or through balances. No. But the system of Allah works through potentials that you and I reach in our lives. Because those individuals out there who might be killing and grieving, when they take a hundred thousand and give it to many orphans and they build orphanages and those orphans are very happy and they grow older to praise that person, does not matter how many orphans they fed, they've still committed crimes and hoarded wealth. And on the balance scale that you and I live by, most people would say, well, look, if he has many bad deeds and a couple good deeds, or let's say more good deeds and bad deeds, then this person will go to heaven. Yes, but what about the heinous crimes that the person has committed? And it's interesting to know that the way the system of Allah works is through a metal of potential. Where when I do something good, it's not that God is happy with me or God is angry with me. But my potential of good is automatically increased and I now am a more worthy human being. It's got nothing to do with God being angry or not angry with me because as we stated, Allah Azzawajal is the all-knowing. And Allah is infinite in the literal meaning, meaning anything that I do does not benefit God or take away from God. 
And yesterday we quoted proofs from the Quran where Allah says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Wallahu ghaniyun wa antum al-fuqara. Allah then continuously states and He says, Wa ma min khayrin fa huwa li anfusikum. God continues and says, Wa man ya'mal mithqala dharatin khayran, yara. Wa man ya'mal mithqala dharatin sharran, yara. God makes it very clear in the Quran that my relationship with you is not a relationship where I need something from you and I'll be happy. And if you don't give it to me, I'll be angry. But the relationship is of a wise parent or a wise teacher to a student. If you want to learn, it benefits you. If you don't want to learn, it will affect you negatively. But ultimately, the choice is yours to make. It's not about me throwing you in hell or not. And it's definitely not about me being angry with you, but you are a human being with potential that I've created. And we gave the analogy before we concluded yesterday. Interestingly, the way we see God typically in our vision of the world, it's as if God is a vindictive teacher who's sitting with people, holding a stick, and you and I are like frightened little children. With a single step or a single move, we are scared that God will strike us and hit us and take away from us which we have. And we've missed the whole point of the law system which God created in order to better benefit us. And it's interesting to know tonight that the concept of empathy and the discussion of empathy dives, dives in and is extremely important when we continue on in the next night. And that's why tonight's topic is titled Empathy Within Islam. Empathy to us is known as the idea of taking myself and putting myself in another individual's shoes and having a wholehearted belief in that concept. Now before I go on to that, what I want to say is Islam preaches empathy very often. And we've heard the lecture about empathy very, a lot of times. Meaning we've heard, take yourself and put yourself in someone else's shoes. But the vision that I'd like to give today of empathy is a very different vision that we're typically used to. Because typically we take empathy and we put it towards those who hurt us from the outside. And don't realize that when, uh, when applied internally within the Shia faith or within Islam, empathy can go a long way into attracting those who've completely left religion. Because if there's one temporary issue, it's young people coming forward and saying, look, the reason I don't come to mosque, or the reason I haven't become religious, or the reason I don't come you know, in gatherings with religious people, is because I feel judged because I've committed some mistakes in my life. And the question that we want to know is what does empathy do to that feeling of judgment that's in our community? Because if the Muslim community can be something, then it's being very judgmental. And it happens a lot of times. Not all individuals, but certain individuals. And the question that we ask tonight is how do we tackle that issue? And how can empathy allow us to overcome being a very judgmental community and go back to being a community which was completely supportive of other individuals? And we'll get to that here in just a moment. First of all, what I'd like to note is there's something very different between being genuine and wholeheartedly accepting something and not really being genuine and wholeheartedly accepting something. And here's the, the difference. When we examine the Quranic narrative, Something that's important to note is when we hear the conversation between Allah Azzawajal and Iblis, there's something that's extremely important to note is typically missed. When Allah speaks to Iblis, Iblis is making claims to Allah, where Allah, first of all, for example, asks him, to him, O Iblis, bow down to Adam, Ahsant. And Iblis refuses, and the argument he puts forward is an interesting argument, because what does he say? He says, O oh Allah, you've created me, created me from fire, and you've created him from clay, my element is superior to his. And within the Quran, the argument that's made is very stupid. It's kind of similar to the things you and I hear today. I'm white and he's black. That means I'm better than him. Or I'm more religious than that person. That means I'm better than him. Or I pray more than this person. I'm better than him. Or I have hijab and this girl doesn't. That means I'm better than her. Similar to some arguments that we might hear today in today's world. And when shaitan makes that argument, when he makes that argument, immediately Allah replies to him. And he says to him that why don't you, you know, why don't you bow down? He makes the argument. Allah says to him then you will be banished. Shaitan comes forward and he makes certain promises which give us the nature of his belief. Because within the religion of Islam, if a person wants to submit, he goes to specific levels. The first level is I submit physically. When an enemy comes to me and says to me, look, you need to submit to my laws and what I've given you because I'm militarily powering you, 
A person drops his weapons and says, look, I immediately submit. I've submit, right? There's nothing else I can do. There's nothing else that I can, you can take from me, but I've submit physically. The mind hasn't submit and the heart hasn't submit, which makes that the low, lowest level of submission. On a second level, there's a type of submission where an individual's mind submits, but his heart never submits. There are people out there who come and tell you, look, I believe this makes sense to me logically, but my heart just cannot grasp this concept. Right? My heart just can't. My mind, it makes sense to me. But wholeheartedly, can I accept it? I can't. It's not sitting well with me. The third level of submission is the, is the level of submission which shaitan was trying to get to but didn't reach. Because mind you, he had worshipped Allah for about 60,000 years. Not only that, but he'd seen creation. Within the Quran, when Allah comes and says, speaks to him, Shaitan reveals certain truths about himself that really make us question our own reality. When he speaks to Allah and he's discussing with Allah, he says to him, He is swearing by Allah's might and he's proving that I believe in God because I know God is almighty. And he says to Allah, Right off the back, we know that he believes in what? In Tawheed. On a second level, shaitan comes and he says, فَبِعَزَّتِكَ لَغْوِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ إِلَّا عِبَادَكَ مِنْهُمُ الْمُخْلَصِينَ Now in Arabic, the word mukhlas and the word mukhlas are two different things. We're talking mukhlas with a fatih and mukhlas with a kasif. Mukhlas in Arabic with a fatha is an individual who's purified from an outside source. Someone else purifies him. In the Arabic language, a mukhlas is an individual who purifies himself. I've purified myself and I'm a mukhlas. The shaitan uses a specific word where he says, إِلَّا عِبَادَكَ مِنْهُمُ الْمُخْلَصِينَ Those whom you have purified. And it's coming from the horse's mouth that there are certain individuals who even shaitan has no authority and no power on. He knows that. So right off the bat, there's a belief in some sort of imamat or prophethood because there are individuals whom even I cannot get a hold of. You have purified them. And this is a reference to the Quran where Allah says, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهِ لِيُذْهَبَ عَنْكُمْ وَرِجْسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيَطَهِرَكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا It's a direct connection to that verse. Moving forward, shaitan says to Allah that, O oh Allah, فَبِعَزَّتِكَ لَغْوِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ إِلَّا عِبَادَكَ مِنْهُمُ الْمُخْلَصِينَ He continues and says, فَانْذُرْنِي إِلَى يَوْمِ يُبْعَثُونَ Let me live until the day that they are resurrected, that they, they come back. Meaning immediately there's a belief in some sort of hereafter. If you examine shaitan's criteria, it's the criteria of your normal day average Muslim. And the question that we ask is where did he go wrong? Where did he go wrong? Because right away he's got a, a resume which says he's worshipped Allah for 60,000 years. That's a very long time if you ask me. Go forward, he believes in Allah, he's swearing by his greatness. He believes in some sort of individuals whom he cannot tamper with, imams or prophets. And finally, he believes in a day of judgment and a resurrection. These are things which are essential to a Muslim. They're called what? Asul al -deen. They are the most important parts of religion. But what's interesting is God comes within the Quran and makes a statement and a claim. And he says, Innahu minal kafirin. He's from the disbelievers. And when you read the Quranic narrative, it just doesn't make sense. Why? This man has worshipped you. This jinn has worshipped you. Not only that, but he's got the criteria of a belief. What is it that's not allowing you to really wholeheartedly take him as one of your believers? Shaheed Mutahari puts light to this. And he says that the reason shaitan was removed is because yes, his mind had submit, his physical had submit, but there was a heartfelt genuineness that he had missed within his belief. As much as you might pray, and as much as you might fast, as much as you might follow Allah or do whatever, if there is no genuine heartfelt belief that what you are doing is right and you are genuinely or heartily convinced, then all of that can be thrown out of the window at any single obstacle that might come your way. And what we want to say tonight is genuine belief 
and actual belief are two, com two completely different things. And the reason I note this is because our discussion today, most people will say that we've had the empathy discussion before. But the question that I want to ask tonight and for the following nights is how many of us within our hearts have a genuine wholehearted belief without a shadow of doubt that I seriously and sincerely understand this or I sincerely make sense of this. And if you are not realistic with yourself, then how will you ever know if you are genuine or not? And it's interesting to note that the empathy discussion for tonight is completely tied, revolving around this idea of being a genuine human being. Because it's noted that if a person can be something, that he can be very deceitful. Not only to others, but to also himself. He can be himself's worst enemy, that I can lie to myself and kid to myself saying that I know this when I actually don't. And empathy is an interesting discussion as we noted. Empathy is known as this ability to take yourself and put yourself in the shoes of someone else. And within the recent 50 years, there's been such a plethora of data, scientific data about empathy that scientists have found out that it's actually hardwired within our biology. In about 1906, there was a special uh, lab that was taking place in Poland. And as this lab was taking place, what they were doing is they were taking monkeys, primates, setting um, sensors to their brains and having them eat walnuts. And they wanted to see which part of the brain would light up when they ate the walnut. And the way science works sometimes, it's, 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 it works in a very spontaneous manner. Something happens and you immediately find some sort of exploration. You're like, wow, I can't believe this. I just figured this out. Through a spontaneous something that just happens or goes wrong, scientists figure something out. One man, one scientist, as a study is being done, walks into the lab and sees a bowl of walnuts, take one, cracks it open, and eats it. And the data is recorded. When scientists went back to that data, they realized that when the primate ate the walnut, the same one specific part of the brain lit up. When the primate saw the man, the scientist, eat the walnut, the same part of the brain then again lit up, even though the primate itself did not eat the walnut, it shared that fruitful experience that the man had shared. And scientists were completely blown away. This is in the year 1906. Not much had been known about the psychology of, of animals and man. They went forward to do more studies and they realized that all mammals, except for dolphins, and they haven't concluded why dolphins cannot feel this, are hardwired to be biologically empathic. If you're scared of spiders and someone next to you has a spider crawling up your arm, you'll feel that jitter, won't you? You'll feel that, that jitter inside of you that I'm scared. Or if you see a, you're scared of snakes and you see a snake on TV wrapping around a person, you'll feel very queasy inside because it'll make you feel um, a specific feeling of, of being scared, for example. And human beings on a biological level are hardwired to be empathic. When we see a child on TV who's being hurt, for example, in Gaza, in, in, in Iraq, in Syria, in any part of the world where someone's hurt, our hearts feel a specific pain. And we ache, and it hurts some of us. And I'll tell you, there are some people who just have completely suppressed that. I don't want to feel that. So whenever something like that comes up, they immediately shut it down. I can't see it. I don't want to see it because my heart can't take it. There are people like that. And then those people say, no, I would like to sympathize. I would like to be empathic with that person because my bio biology tells me. And we just can't help it. If we see a person on the street who's being hurt, our hearts yearn and say, you know what? Why is this person being hurt? And what's going on? Why don't we help them? Why don't we try to get them to improve? That's just the way that we are biologically. And empathy has such, created such movements in the world that it's allowed individuals to overcome specific movements within themselves. What I mean by this is empathy has been put under studies where if an individual takes himself and puts himself outside of his shoes into someone else's shoes, the life experience that he receives and the amount of knowledge that he gets is a wisdom that would be able, that should, should be gotten in about 50 or 100 years. What I mean by that is it gives wisdom to the individual. It allows the person to all of a sudden come out and say, you know what, I've got a specific wisdom because I put myself in that person's shoes. And we'll get to this in just a moment, but our imams and prophets were masters of empathy. And we always ask ourselves these, stories, these questions. When we're young kids, we always hear these stories of the imams, someone being unkind to them, right? Hitting them, striking them, 
or for somehow making them angry or, or trying to push their buttons. And the Imams all the time reply in this very kind, sincere and genuine way. And we never as young children seem to figure out how they ever did it. Because when someone comes to us and tries to push our buttons, we're immediately angered. And the solution that we found is that empathy and the way that the Imams actually saw people allowed them and helped them to see past their issues. And here's what I mean by that. Empathy is linked to something known as the iceberg model. And the iceberg model is this idea that we only see 10% of any person's actions. And 90% of them we cannot see. Because when you see an iceberg, you only see the tip. The rest of the iceberg is underwater and you can't see the rest. That 10% that we see is a human being's facial expressions. We see that person's looks. We see that individual's facial emotions. We see how they're dressed. We see specific details. But there are things in the 90% underneath which we have no idea what they are. Things such as emotions tragedies, upbringings, trauma, experiences, travel, economic situation, social situation, abuse, hurt, physical ailments, things that we do not see under the 10% of a person when we immediately meet them. Sure, if we get to know them, we might be able to see them or understand them, but we only see 10% of a person. And the iceberg model comes and says that when human beings empathize with each other and they start to take themselves and put themselves in someone else's shoes, it becomes very hard for them to judge and they immediately start showing more reciprocal respect. Because if there's an issue today with the social structure that we have, is we have way too many people who tolerate each other and not enough people who actually respect each other because tolerance and respect are two completely different things. Tolerance is the idea where I see you, but I speak to you behind my nose. I see you. And when I say salam to you, I say salam to you, I smile. But in my heart, I smile to someone, I say, you know what, in my heart, I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm actually seeing this person again. Or in my heart, I'm like seeing you and I'm saying hi. Or when there's people, I'm praising you. But when I go back to my actual house, I'm like, you know, this guy is this, this, this talking nonsense. Like, what is he saying? What's he doing? Right? Many people are like that. When you're in front of them, they'll show you that respect. But in their hearts, there's something very different. And mind you, this happens with friend relationships, marital relationships, and all day relationships, relationships with people that we have all the time. Because people tolerate each other. But the actual meaning of respect is that I have nothing in my heart against you. Tolerance is when I see you. I say hi to you. I say salam to you. But in my heart, I have a small feeling of pain and sting when I see you. And when I say salam, I wish I had never said salam. I wish you had never seen me, I had never seen you. And this happens with the brothers and the sisters. It happens in motherly, fatherly relationships, in marital relationships, and friendship relationships. Respect is no. When I see you, I wholeheartedly have love and compassion for you in my heart. And nothing inside me ails when I see you. The problem with the world today is that we have complete tolerance for everyone else, but not enough respect. And this is said for religion, this is said for politics, this is said for individuals who are allowing religion to separate us, this is for individuals who allow politics to separate them, these are individuals who allow beliefs to separate them, these are individuals who allow economic basis, social basis to separate them. Most of the time we have tolerance in our hearts, but not enough respect to other people. The iceberg model comes and says, look, the people or the individuals in front of you are a certain way because of the past experiences, the trauma, the emotion that they go through that you cannot see. I'll give you a brief example. Right? Oftentimes in our lives, we meet specific individuals and we look at them and say, look, why does this person act this specific way? I just don't get it. Why is he angry all the time? Or why is she angry all the time? Why is it every time I come home, she has to be yelling? Why is it every time I come home, he can't even smile? Why is it that when I see this person, I talk to them about my beliefs, they immediately look away? Why do these people see me and scrutinize me and put me down? A lot of the times when we see other people, we immediately judge them based off of what they say and what they do because of our preconditioned experiences. Mind you, 
The way that human beings work is that you and I are 99.9% .9 what? We are 99.9% .9 products of our own society. I never chose the family to be born in. Never chose that. I never chose the mom and dad to have, which taught me everything I know. I never chose the economic status that I was born into. I never chose what religion to be born into. I was simply born. I never specifically chose what kind of lifestyle I want to have. I, was, I never chose where I want to be born. All of these are factors which make the person who he is. The reason I am why I am is because of the background that I have, the family that I was born into, the economic lifestyle, the social lifestyle, the religious upbringing. Otherwise, if I was born in China with different parents and a different religion and a different ideology, I'd be a very different person. I wouldn't be here because I'd probably be speaking Chinese, right? Or whatever language is spoken. You and I are social construct of our societies. Most people, when they meet others, they immediately remove empathy and they judge them based on immediately what they see. I see you the way you are and I hate you because you're like that. Well, hold on. Did you look only at the 10%? Or did you ever dig down in that 90% and try to find something else that's in there? Did you look at the person's past experiences? Did you look at their emotions? Did you look at what trauma they've been through? Did you look at the experiences they've had? Did you ever see what kind of things they've been through? Or are you simply making a judgment because you immediately see them? And I've said this and I'll say it. If there's something that we Muslims are very good at, it's at immediately making judgment without actually understanding the 90%. Without really understanding 90%. We see the 10%, we make that judgment, and that 90 is completely gone. On a first level, empathy allows us to see people deeper, deeper than what they actually are. And I'll tell you, if we apply this to every person that we see, we would look at people at a very, very different way. Very different way. And I'll get to some examples at the end where judgment takes a very full throttle role. Okay? What I mean by this is, there's a lot of situations, specifically within our communities, where people are immediately judged immediately judged without really understanding the idea. I remember at one point, I was walking with one of my friends um, in the mall, and he sees a sister walking. She was walking, she's wearing a headscarf, a hijab, but she was, you know, wearing tight clothes. And that's obviously her decision between her and Allah, right? We're walking, and he's, you know, she, he's next to me, and he looks at me and says, you know, he's whispering, and she's walking by. He says, you know, look at, he's kind of, Poking over and he's like, look, if you're going to wear the hijab and you're going to wear tight clothes, why wear it? Take it off and, you know, remove it. What's the point of wearing hijab? He immediately made a judgment about her. She was walking by. She actually heard him. She heard what he was saying. So she walks by. She looks at him. Very, you know, it was, it was a beautiful situation. And it kind of taught me how judgmental I am sometimes in my life. She sees him. She looks at him. She says, brother, I want you to know that a week ago I wasn't wearing the hijab. And now I'm actually wearing it. A week ago... I wasn't even wearing the hijab. You don't know what family I've been through. The brother next to me had no idea what kind of upbringing she was in. He has no idea what kind of struggle she's been through in her heart. He doesn't know what it took for her to reach that level to actually put the scarf on because no man will ever understand. The minute we bombard, and I, I've said this before, that a lot of the reason we have this problem today, specifically back home where I'm from, where sisters take off their hijab, is because they feel unsupported in a community. There's no support that if a girl doesn't wear a hijab, she's immediately judged as a not good girl or a bad person. And I tell you, sometimes, sometimes it happens so where it's not only the general public, but the alim who comes up and sits makes comments to a sister where she feels uncomfortable. I mean, there a lot of the times certain comments made about uh, you know, sisters, the way they put their makeup on or their hijab on, whether it's through social media or through actual gatherings, where women feel offended, right? Where a man says, sister, your hair is showing, please put on a scarf. We don't want no convertible hijab, for example. It almost pokes fun at the life of the other individual. But you don't know what kind of upbringing she's had. You don't know how she's been raised. You don't know what it took for her to go through that journey to put on the actual scarf. Or even within the brothers, at times I see some guys who if a brother doesn't pray, he's immediately judged as a bad person. Or if a brother has some issues, he's immediately judged as a bad person. This support system within us doesn't exist. And I tell you beautifully, something beautiful about the West 
is today in the West, there are individuals who are heroin addicts. Imagine, heroin addicts. Who if they want to receive treatment, they want to receive treatment, the government will actually set up areas for them. Look how supportive some governments can be who we call non-Islamic, right? But the action is as Islamic as can be. They actually set up clinics where a heroin addict can shoot heroin so that he doesn't infect anyone else with AIDS so that he can get the proper treatment while he's shooting heroin and he's an addict. Look at the level of support. And I say to you that when the messenger of Allah Muhammad came to Arabia, the amount of the lack of judgment that he had to any person was something astonishing. This man, imagine, had to literally come to Arabia, put his hands in the depths of hell where the people were living, raise his hand and raise them together with him to make them feel like, you know what, I'm not judging you, I'm here to actually support you. And we think, well, why do so many people come to Islam? Well, because he made them feel comfortable. He never went out on rants against them, how they're not good people, how they don't wear the scarf, how they don't pray. He supported them. He came to them and said, look, you're a youth. I'm a youth. We have certain issues. Let's work together. Let me support you and not look down on you. Because if I don't support you, how can you ever get out of what you're in? How? And the Prophet created a culture where sin was never something looked down upon, but it was a culture where sin was seen as something to work up towards. Sin was seen as something that you've made a mistake. Let us come forward and let me help you. One man comes to the Prophet. Look at how comfortable they must have been with him. One man comes to the Prophet and sits next to him. He says, Ya Rasulullah, I'm a drunk and I can't help but drinking alcohol. Imagine you're going to the most powerful man of your time who has dictated and said alcohol is bad. Dictated it. But you feel so comfortable because you know he'll find you a solution. Because in his heart, he looks at you as a human being who's vulnerable to make mistakes. God has made you that way. You are a human. Accept your humanity that you make mistakes and move on with that reality and allow yourself to move forward. The Prophet looks at him and says to him, okay. He says, Ya Rasulullah, I can't leave. I can't leave drinking alcohol. I have to. Rasulullah says to him, what's the next thing that you're addicted to? He says, I'm addicted to dates. I love to eat dates. He says, okay. Um, go for a month, leave dates, and come back to me within a month and see how you're doing with your alcohol problem. There's no problem. He comes back after a month. He says to him, Ya Rasulullah, I've left dates and I've left alcohol. He says to him, why? He says to him, after I left dates, I strengthened my willpower and then I was able to leave alcohol as well. Both things I left immediately. Rasulullah said to him, now that you've left alcohol, you can go back to consuming dates because there's nothing wrong with dates. Rasulullah worked in a way where he found pragmatic solutions to people's issues. There was no judgment that because the person wears the trendiest clothing, it means he's not religious. If the person dresses this specific way, or looks a certain way, or acts a certain way, then he's not religious. But if the person wears a dishdasha and a specific clothing and grows a long beard, that means he's immediately religious. How do we get this? Right? There are judgmental standards which we've applied which don't allow us to empathize with people. And there's a beautiful story of, um, of, of Harun al-Rashid sitting one day with one of his companions. And they were having a discussion argument whether people who have long beards, are they more religious or not? Classical, because, I mean, even yesterday I had one young man come to me and said, look, brother, uh, when I grow the beard, is it because I want to be religious, right? So, Mansoor, or uh, Harun Ashi is sitting with one of his companions, and he says to him, look, people who have beards, I'm telling you, are really smart. And the guy's arguing, no, no, people who have beards are not smart. He says to him, the next man with a beard who walks in, let's test him to see how smart he is. He says, fine. Man comes up, walks by, and sits in front of Harun Rashid. He sits. Harun says to him, what's your last name? He gives him his first name. First stupid mistake. He says to him, what's your first name? He gives him his last name. Harun says to him, look, I've got a mas'ala that I want to ask you. A religious question. Can you answer it for me since you're such a smart man? You look very bearded. You look very smart. Can, you ask, can I ask you a question? He says, sure, no problem. He says to him, look, what's the hukum on a man who sells a sheep to another man? The second man who bought the sheep takes it home 
and the sheep vomits on the man's eye and the man's eye gets hurt, right? Who pays his fidya money, the, the purchaser or the seller? Who pays if it, it's been sold and the sheep vomits, it vomits on the buyer's eye. He just bought the thing and it vomited on his eye. Who pays the fidya money? So the guy looks at him, he says to him, well, obviously the seller. And I was like, how did you come to this conclusion? He's like, well, it has to be the seller because he should have told the buyer that there was a catapult inside of the sheep's stomach where it's launching things out of its mouth. If a sheep vomits, it's got nothing to do with having a catapult inside its stomach, it's just sick. And that Ruaya showed, proved to even Harun or she that just because you have a beard does not mean you're a very smart man, right? Likewise, if you wear the trendiest clothing and look in the trendiest of ways, does not mean you're not religious, you're not a scholar, you're not appealing, absolutely not. That time difference has no actuality in, in who you are as a person. But there has been unempathic standards which are set, which makes us very prone to judgment. We're very quick to judge. Right? Instead of supporting an individual who's fallen, instead of helping him, we immediately judge them. I had a girl come to me in Dearborn, and I swear to you, it really broke my heart when this happened. She comes to me, right? In one of the Islamic centers, I was giving a lecture about hijab and modesty that day. She comes to me holding her scarf, crying. I said, what's wrong? Crying. I said, what, you know, what's the issue? Are you okay? She says, brother, I came today to your majlis, specifically with the intention of listening and putting on my scarf in front of the sheikh. That's amazing, but why are you crying? She says, when I walked in to the mosque, one sister looks at me and says, how could you walk into the masjid without the hijab? Don't you know Allah will hang you by your hair on the day of judgment? Don't you know that? She had come into the mosque with the intention of putting on hijab. The lady sees her and says, look, don't you know that God is going to hang you by your hair? For all you know, there are certain individuals who if you put mountains of clothes on them, they don't know what modesty is. There are some people who might not wear hijab, but they're Im immensely modest and have the highest amount of modesty. It happens. It happens all the time. To show you that at times as a community, we can be more judgmental towards our young people, which really drives them away. I talk to a lot of young people. I said, look, why don't you come to the mosque? He says, look, there's no appreciation for me or there's no exception for me. People don't accept people like me, right? When the Prophet came, when the Imams came, their doors were open to any individual who had sinned because they knew that everyone has a different path to Allah and everyone has a specific relationship to Allah. And interestingly, our Imams, when they come forward and they give us the lessons they do, there is an immense amount of psychological understanding within those lessons. Meaning, when Imam Hassan is approached by a man in Medina who's cursing him, who's yelling at him, who at every moment is cursing his name, and Imam looks at the man. He looks at the man, and he says to him, that, oh man, if you are poor, then we will assist you. If you're poor, we will help you. The man's cursing him. No. Imam Hassan says, if you are poor, we will help you. If you need a house, we'll take care of you. If you need some help, we're here for you. Imam realized this man's upbringing and who's been influencing him has a big effect of why he's thinking that way. And unless I become the greater person and start to empathize with him, then I can never become better than him. Many of us, sometimes we have relations with the people right, at home, other places. If I have a relationship with you and I know you're angry, Right? Instead of getting immediately angry, asking the question why makes such a big effect. Because people start to emotionally open up and tell you the reasons why they're upset. Whether it's childhood trauma, whether it's something bad that happened that day, whether they went through an experience, whether they were fired, whether they got a pay cut, whether they were laid off, whatever happened, people act a specific way because of their environmental factors and their previous history and trauma. And if we as human beings are emotionally safe and secure, to tap into that trauma, to tap into that history and become understanding and loving, then we can get much further in our relationships today. Perhaps reach the level of our Imams, inshallah. Because when an Imam comes and is completely judged and destroyed by a person and replies in the most beautiful of ways, the Imam is saying, no problem. I understand what you're going through. Today we sit here, we commemorate Imam Ali alayhi salam, and Imam has one of the most powerful stories when it comes to empathy. And this rings with me so much every time I say this story. Imam one day is walking in Kufa as the Khalifa. 
and he sees a lady sitting on the ground, four children, and cursing the name of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Cursing his name. Imam comes to her and sits next to her. She's got no idea Ali ibn Abi Talib is next to her. He doesn't know that. Imam comes to her, sits next to her, and says to her, O oh servant of Allah, is everything okay? And she says, you know what? Because of Ali ibn Abi Talib and his wars, my husband and my son have died in his wars, and now these young children have no one to look after them. She was cursing the name of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Imam in that moment realizes that no matter what I say, the emotional grief this woman has will topple everything I'm going to say to her. I can say to her, it's not my fault, I'm sorry, they came to fight. That emotional grief the woman had, that any human being would feel, that hurt in her heart, the fact that she saw them dead, the trauma that she's received is so powerful that I can only understand and sympathize with her and empathize and help her. Put myself in her shoes and help her. Imam, what does he do? He says to her, okay, these are your children. She says, yes, yes, let's go to the house. He takes her to the house. What this lady used to do is she used to boil water and wait for the kids to sleep because they were so hungry. She would tell them, I'm boiling food for you. And she would boil it for so long they would go to sleep because of how less they had no food and they were so hungry. She had to lie to them to put them to sleep. She was so poor. And Imam alayhi salam comes and he brings flour, he brings water, he comes to the house and he says to her, Amat Allah, shall I make the food? Shall I make the food and you play with the kids? Or shall I play with the kids and you make the food? And she says to him, play with the kids because they need a fatherly figure after their father has that. Imam takes the children and starts to throw them up. This is the, this is the, the children of the lady whose mother was just, cur the lady was just cursing him. She was just yelling at him. Imam takes them, puts them in his lap, starts to throw them up and down, up and down, plays with them like they're his own children. Look at the kindness that this man had in his heart. Look at the empathy that he felt, the emotional understanding. He wasn't only a valiant warrior, he was an emotional master. He understood people's emotions and worked with those emotions. Because he empathized with people. He sympathized with people. This is the same man who on the battlefield says, when I want to kill someone, I look into their eyes and I see a thousand generations before that to see if there's one good person in their generation, I won't kill them. Why? Because he empathizes with that individual. His heart feels for him. The lady comes, she makes the, the dough. Imam Ali takes them and he puts them inside the oven. And sparks of that come at his face. And Amin Mumin alayhi salam, as the sparks come to his face, he says, Dhuq ya ibn Abi Talib, taste, O son of Abu Talib. Never forget the orphans and the yatama. Always be by their side and never forget them. This lady was cursing him. Her neighbor comes into the house and says to her, Who's this? Your master Ali ibn Abi Talib is in the house. What are you doing? She says to her, is this Ali ibn Abi Talib? She says, yes. She says, I'm so sorry. I had no idea it was you. I had no idea you were actually here. Imagine how safe this lady would have felt that this person actually understood my emotions. He actually understood how I felt. He put himself in my shoes as a grieving mother. There are individuals in the world today, if, they, if you show them, if they kill person after person and beheading after beheading, they have no sympathy and empathy in their hearts. There are people who are willing to bombard buildings, kill children, hundreds of young children, women, and have no empathy in their heart whatsoever. The humanity has been stripped from them. Otherwise, what does it mean to be human? It means that we love, that we care. That we emotionally bond with other people. We understand the trials and tribulations. We don't judge them because they make a mistake here or there. We don't judge them because they might not have hijab on. We don't judge them because they might not pray. We don't judge them because they're a different religion. But we help them. As a community, we come together and say, how can we attract everyone and support every single individual? And if the imams were masters at something, it's at making everyone feel belonged. Take a look at a person like Abu Dhar al-Ghifari. Abu Dhal Ghifani, before he became a Muslim, was a bandit man in the deserts. Was a bandit. He would stop caravans. He would take steel from them and he would let them go their way. This man was a thief. The Prophet later brings him into Islam and makes him one of the most regarded individuals within Arabia. How does that even happen? 
It's because Islam prides itself in having open doors to every individual who might make a mistake. That's the way that we've been taught within Islam. And hence Allah comes with the profound verse. And it's truly powerful on these nights where he says, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَتُوا مَنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ Jamia. He says, oh my servants who've done an abundance of sins on themselves. Look at the mercy that God possesses. Do not feel shaken and do not feel hurt. Do not give up on the mercy of Allah, but truly God forgives your sins, all of them. Each and every single sin Allah forgives. Allah is showing you that this religion is about acceptance. It's about compassion. It's about love. And I tell you, there's none other that showed love other than Ali ibn Abi Talib. And it's sad to say on this night that when Amir al passes away, he is hurt and struck by none other than the person whom he raises. You'd think that when Imam takes a young child like Ibn Muljim, Imam would sit him in his lap. He would sit Ibn Muljim in his lap. And he would, after sitting Ibn Muljim in his lap, he would sit him there and he would feed him and he would say to him, eat, O oh my killer. Even though Imam knew that he would later be killed by Ibn Muljim, he still sat him in his lap and cared for him and showed him care. That's why it's sad to say that Imam Ali السلام, dies and is killed. It's at the hands of none other than the person he raised. Imam Ali السلام, on that night that he was struck was in the house of his daughter Umm Kulthum. And he realizes that that night there's something very different. And the message here is with the empathy of Imam Ali السلام. Amir al muminin moments after he's killed, and we'll get to his killing in just a moment, after he's struck and is on the floor, sees Ibn Muljim completely tied. Tied. And Imam looks at everyone around him. He says to them, loosen the ropes that are around his hands. I fear they might be too tight on his hands. Look at the compassion, the love and the empathy that this man holds in his heart that even his killer, he's saying, tighten, loosen the ropes because his hands might hurt. Imam then is offered milk. They offer him milk. And Amir al mumini refuses. And he says, give to Ibn Muljim before you give to me. Let him drink before you let me drink. Even though the poison was seeping in his brain. On that night, Amir al-Mumin is in the house of his daughter, Um Kulthum. And he realizes that this is the destined night that the Prophet had awaited him with. Amir al-Mumin on that night tightens his rope and he would recite these lines. Ishdud اشدد حيازي مك للموت فإن الموت لا يقيك إمام علي عليه السلام would start walking outside of his house his daughter on Kulthum says to him Father Amir al-Mu'mineen I see that you look very different tonight what's wrong with your face? Imam says, daughter, this is the promised night that Rasulullah had promised me. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam makes his way out of the house. As he's walking out of the house, he looks up at the stars and the sky and he says, As-salamu alayka ya Rasulullah. Hadha al-yawm al-ladhi wa'attani bih. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam reaches the Masjid of Al-Kuf. He sees Ibn Muljim lying down on his stomach. He says to him, Ya Ibn Muljim, don't sleep that way because that is how Shaytan sleeps on his stomach. Amir al-Mu'mineen goes towards his mihrab and he walks towards his mihrab. He reaches his mihrab. And it's interesting that Imam Ali alayhi salam, when he comes to pray, not only is he killed when he wasn't, when he was fasting, rather Imam was killed in a time where he wasn't even praying salat al-subh. He wasn't even allowed to finish his salah. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam comes and he starts to pray nafilat al-subh. Amir al-Mu'mineen starts to pray, he finishes the first ruk'ah, he comes into sujood. 
He stands and he comes for the second rukah and recites his dua. He recites his khunut. Imam goes down into rukuh. Ibn Muljim behind him realizes this is the chance to strike Amir al Mu'minin. He runs behind Imam Ali alayhi salam and he strikes the head of Amir al Mu'minin alayhi salam. Rahimallah man la dawa aliyya Aywa mazluma aywa imama Abu Hussein ma ya tam misyam Wallah Abu Hussein Abu Hussein ma ya tam misyam Imam Ali alayhi salam is surrounded by his children. He's surrounded by Hassan. He's surrounded by Hussein. They see the strike of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. They sit next to Abu, their father, Amir al-Mu'mineen. One holds him. Al-Hassan is crying over him. Al-Hussein is crying by his side. They bring Ibn Muljim to the Imam alayhi salam. And Imam immediately tells them, loosen the ropes around the hand of Ibn Muljim. I fear that they may hurt his hands. What a heart. What a heart that this man has. They then bring him milk and they say to him, O oh, Amir al muminin drink from the milk. He says to them, give to Ibn Muljim before you give me anything. They pick Amir al muminin alayhi salam up and they walk him towards his house. Now here's a tragedy. You know, when a young girl knows that her father is coming home, when she expects her father, especially the valiant father that she has of hers to come home, she never expects her father to come home being carried on shoulders, right? She expects him to come walking in that into the house. She expects him to be carried to carrying her. She expects him to hug her. Amir al-Mu'mineen realizes that Zainab is in the house waiting for me. He then looks towards Hassan and Hussein and he says to them, put me down, let me walk on my own. They say to him, Abba Amir al muminin Oh, Father Amir al muminin why is it we want to carry you to the house? He says to them, I fear that my daughter is a lad. I fear that Zainab will see me carried on your back. She might think something is wrong with me. And I say, oh, Amir al muminin if you saw, if Zainab sees you, her heart would break. What would happen to you if you saw her reaction towards your son, Aba Abdullah, on the day of Ashura? Oh, Amir al muminin Zainab on that day saw your son, Aba Abdullah, beheaded. You know where I'm going with this. She saw Aba Abdullah beheaded. She stands on that day on a Tella Zainabi, and as she stands there, she looks down at the bodies, and she says to her brother, Akhi Hussein, in kunta hayyan fa'adrikna, wa in kunta mayitan fa'amruka wa amruna ila Allah. Brother Abba Abdullah, if you're alive, then help us. And if you have died, then your situation is now with Allah. But what breaks the heart is Amir al Mu'mineen was always a protector of Zainab. Amir al Mu'mineen was always the one who protected Zainab. That's why one poet beautifully narrates the life of Zainab back when she was in Kufa. And Zainab says with her, with her tongue to the caravan leader as she's going back to, to Medina, she says, she She's describing Kuba to the caravan leader. She's 
describing the days of Eid to the caravan leader, hoping he would compare them to her situation in Karbala. من يجبل علينا العيد تحب الواد مجفوف والله ويقولوا لنسانة تريد تعيد زينة ببه العيد تحب من هالجدم والإيد وبهذا اليوم وبايا الفحل ما يرضى ليش يا زينب نساهم من يعيدني خافا للزلم يرحان ويحجن من يشوف This is the same Zainab who later comes and says يا بي حسين يضرب الله ونسقف بدي أنا أخويا يا صاحت يضرب لو نسقف بدي خويا بدي أنا بدي أنا بدي والله وعمت عين اللي يصد بالعين لي she then turns her face towards that river ها you know who's buried at the river تقل خايا يا عباس يا عباس يا عباس خايا يا عباس من تلي جبت لي والله خايا يا عباس من تلي جبت لي وبيدك يا خويا ركبتني بس ما رحت علي وعفتني And that's why later when she wants to walk towards the river Al-Faraj She recites these lines and she says ولا عين ولا عين يلوذن يم أبو فاضل And I'll speak tomorrow why I'm mentioning Abu Fadl Because Imam Ali lays him as a protector أدقل ولا عين ولا عين ولا عين أدقل ولا عين ولا عين ولا عين ولا عين يلوجن يم أبو فاضل خايا ولا عين ولا عين ولا عين خايا لا إيد البقت عندي خايا ولا عين ولا عين ولا عين يا خايا ما أقدر أعتابج علي يا خايا ما أقدر أعتابج تقل وداوي وداوي القلب شاجر على ابن امي خويا وداوي وداوي لا مجروح حتى قعيد وداوي 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 ولا غايب واقول يعود لي يا ولا غايب واقول سيعلم الذين ظلموا على محمد أي منقلب ينقلبون ولا عاقبة للمتقين يا الله. Brothers and sisters, on these blessed nights, on the nights of Qadr, there are many individuals who ask us for our dua, and those who cannot reach to us ask us for our duas. As you know, and I mentioned this last night, we are sitting under a roofed area. 
we have fans, we are safe to come and pray, we're safe to come here. We feel safe being here, but there are individuals out there who don't have that luxury. Your brothers out there who are being bombarded by bombs every single day, people who are actually sitting and spectating bombs falling over Palestine. There are those individuals in Iraq who are being butchered as we speak. Only this month alone has been the highest death toll in Iraq ever since 2007, as one article was mentioning. There's so much killing all over the world. Those who are being killed in Burma, those who are being killed in Syria, let's raise our hands together and pray for them because as much as we do, our prayer is the strongest weapon that we have. Within Dua, Kumail Ali salam says, وَسِلَاحُهُ الْبُكَاءُ our, our, our weapon is our prayer and our crying. The fact that we come together and we congregate and we pray together, it's extremely powerful. If you have children next to you, let them raise their hands because they are young. They are pure. God will accept from them, inshallah. Where we cite Amani Jubu together five times. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. أمان يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء All together أمان يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أمان يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أمان يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء. Last time together. أمان يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء. يا الله 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 اللهم نسألك بفاطمة وأبيها وبعليها وبنيها والسر المستودع فيها يا الله اللهم شافي وعافي جميع المرضى يا الله اللهم احفظنا بعينك التي لا تنام يا الله اللهم اقض جميع حوائجنا يا الله اللهم لا تسلط علينا من لا يرحمنا يا الله ويرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات نقرأ جميع السورة المباركة الفاتحة تسبقها صلوات